السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقال الذين كفروا لا تسمعوا لهذا القرآن والغو فيه لعلكم تغلبون فلنذيقن الذين كفروا عذابا شديدا ولنجزينهم أسوأ الذي كانوا يعملون ذلك جزاء أعداء الله النار لهم فيها دار الخلد جزاء بما كانوا بآياتنا يجحدون وقال الذين كفروا ربنا أرنا الذين أضلانا من الجن والإنس نجعلهما نجعلهما تحت أقدامنا ليكونا من الأسفلين إن الذين قالوا ربنا الله ثم استقاموا ثم استقاموا تتنزل عليهم الملائكة ألا تخافوا ولا تحزنوا وأبشروا بالجنة التي كنتم توعدون نحن أولياؤكم في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة ولكم فيها ما تشتهي أنفسكم ولكم فيها ما تدعون نزلا من غفور رحيم ومن أحسن قولا ممن دعا إلى الله وعمل صالحا وعمل صالحا وقال إنني من المسلمين بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سلك طريقهم وسار على نهجهم ودعا بدعوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد we begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sending blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah bless him and his entire household. And may Allah bless all his companions. And may he bless all of those who have struggled and strived to preserve the deen and to convey it in a way that it has come to us today. And may we be also from amongst those who learn it, put it into practice and convey it to others such that our children be the torch bearers as well up to the final day. I mean, my beloved brothers and sisters in Islam, we are indeed very fortunate to be here in the city of Doha, which is a beautiful city in the Muslim world, and where we have so many masajid that it would be difficult for one who did not know the exact figure to actually just count them. And we are so fortunate to be from amongst those who can fulfill our salah at the time of salah without discrimination and without any hindrance. For indeed, there are some people in other countries of the globe who find it so difficult to fulfill their duty of prayer and salah because of the workplace and because of them living in countries where they are in minority. And with that hindrance, they still read their salah. Why is it that with us, without the hindrance, we still find ourselves lacking in salah sometimes? It's just a point that I decided to start with seeing, mashallah, the large number of brothers and sisters who are here this evening. So 
It's important for us to know that if we think it's difficult for us to fulfill salah, for some reason, you should know that there are others who are fulfilling it with real difficulty. They are fulfilling it in a way that you know the surrounding does not actually assist in a lot of ways or facilitate the fact that they should be fulfilling this salah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from amongst those who realize the gift. Now, I started off by making mention of salah. One of the prime reasons is the topic this evening, as you and I know, is regarding Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening surah of the Quran, Al-Fatiha, which means the opening surah, as it is. And we commence our salah with that surah to the degree that salah is not correct for the one who does not read Surah Al-Fatiha. لا صلاة لمن لم يقرأ فيها بفاتحة الكتاب. I'm sure we would be well aware with this hadith of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم, wherein he states that your salah is not valid if you haven't read Surah Al-Fatiha in it. That is how important the surah is. So why is it that we find ourselves knowing the surah off by heart, but we pay lip service to it in salah? And this happens to a lot of us, if not all, at some stage. The concentration levels on the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha is at times so low that it becomes a minimum. It becomes bare. So we all would know Surah Al-Fatiha, including the young children that are sitting here in front of me. But if I were to ask you, when you fulfill the Surah in Salah, do you actually concentrate on its meaning? Do you actually know what you are saying? Do you know the connotation, the implication, or do you know how serious a surah it is? If it was not so serious, and it was not such an important surah, do you really think we would be asked to repeat it in every unit of our salah, in every rak'ah of salah? It has in it the core message of the entire deen and religion that we follow. So the connotation, the implication, or do you know how serious a surah it is? If it was not so serious, and it was not such an important surah, do you really think we would be asked to repeat it in every unit of our salah, in every rak'ah of salah? It has in it the core message of the entire deen and religion that we follow. It has in it the different types of tawheed. When we say tawheed, we are talking of the oneness of Allah. Islam is based on the oneness of Allah. We believe in one supreme deity that we worship. And there is none worthy of worship besides him. We all utter the shahada, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And we reiterate that so many times by tongue. It's important that we follow through with our hearts and our actions. Because we need to know that to enter the fold of Islam, one requires three main aspects. The utterance or the declaration of the shahada to bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah by tongue and thereafter to believe it in the heart and thereafter to practice upon whatever it leads us to. Once I believe that Allah is the one whom there is none worthy of worship besides, I need to make sure that everything I do is in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He sent me a book. He sent me a messenger and he sent me a guide. And this is why it's important for me to follow that guide. What's the point of saying I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then I don't follow. And what's the point of bearing witness that Muhammad may peace be upon him is the final messenger, the messenger whom we are the ummah or the nation of and yet we don't follow. So this evening inshallah I'd like to take a look or a stroll through the surah and I'd like to start off by making mention of one of the names of the surah. We all know it as Surah Al-Fatiha. It is also known as As-Salah. As-Salah. That is one of the names of the surah. Perhaps after the fact that it is read in Salah so many times and it is repeated. And this is why if you look at the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam connected to Surah Al-Fatiha, he says Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has said and this is known as Hadith Qudsi, which means it's a Hadith which is relating what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said. But obviously there is a difference between Hadith Qudsi and Quran in the sense that Quran we read in Salah, 
we cannot change the, even a single wording of it and so on. But when it comes to hadith Qudsi, we don't read hadith in salah. And at the same time, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes if you have a small wording which does not change the meaning, instead of, you know, a little wow, you might perhaps mistakenly say something which is slightly different for as long as the meaning is complete, you will not be as sinful as if you were, as you were, had you changed the word of the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deeper understanding. So the hadith says, قَسَمْتُ الصَّلَاةَ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عَبْدِي نِصْفَيْنِ I have divided Surah Al-Fatiha between myself and my worshipper into two. And this is very interesting because if you want to take a literal meaning of the term Salah and you say the prayer, then that Surah which is read in prayer all the time, Allah says, I've divided it into two parts between myself and my worshipper. When my worshipper declares, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, when he says all praise, and I'm sure we all know the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha as well, inshallah. Is that correct? I see all the smiles, which means yes, inshallah. It's correct. We know the meaning of Surah Al-Fatiha in the English language. Today we want to go deeper into it and we want to currentize it. Currentizing means, how does it affect me today? That's what it means. So we want to bring it, inshallah, to the current time. So, if we say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of the worlds. That's a simple translation. But there is a response. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hamidani abdi. My worshipper has declared my praise. So when you say, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, take a moment to think of what you've said and ponder for a moment that as you have said that, Allah has responded to say, my worshipper has praised me, Allahu Akbar. Look at how we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, uh, sometimes when we are in a rush and we start our salah, there is a certain way that we start it. If I have a moment, I'll show you in a few minutes, inshallah. That would not be fair. We are actually plugging in with our maker. I am praising him and he is saying, for myself and yourselves, my worshipper has declared my praise. Then we continue to say, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, most beneficent, most merciful. And he says, my worshipper has declared my majesty or my greatness. And then we say, Maliki yawmiddin. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we say, owner of the day of judgment, owner of the day of judgment, he says, my worshipper has declared my greatness or my majesty. Amazing. So three responses we got, one with every verse. And there are seven verses of the surah. That is why then one of the names of the surah is also as sabul Mathani, which means those seven verses that are constantly repeated. The reason why it is called that is because we repeat the surah so often. It has so much blessing in it. So it is also called the seven verses that are repeated often. Now there is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars as to whether the Bismillah rahman rahim at the beginning is a part of the surah or not. Mainly two opinions and the opinion that says it is the first verse, they, they would start counting from Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen six verses down with the last portion as one. And those who say it is not a part of the surah itself, they still read it, obviously. They would still read it. And they would say the last portion is one verse. Uh, uh, the last portion instead of being one verse is divided into two. So it still makes seven verses as sab'ul mathani. The only reason I'm making mention of this, if you notice sometimes if you enter a masjid, sometimes the imam says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim aloud. Perhaps he is from those who believes in the opinion that that Bismillah is a part of the surah. So we need to read it aloud. There is nothing wrong with that. And we don't want to debate on that subject. We, it all comes down to the same thing because even those who say it is not a part of the surah, they will still tell you that you, you should read it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the benefit of the basmalah or the bismillah. So if we have got the answers from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thrice, there is now a verse where we are saying, Amazing verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us this verse and we repeat it in salah.
You alone we worship and you alone we seek help from. When this verse is said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is between myself and my worshipper and now I will give my worshipper whatever he asks for. He is saying, now I will give my worshipper whatever he asks for. So, we start making a dua. We've already been praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he has been making mention of how we have been praising him. And after we have read the three verses, the fourth one, which is the middle verse, Allah says, this is now between myself and my worshipper. And for him is whatever he will ask for. So what is the most important prayer we have? What is it that we will ask for thereafter? We ask for guidance and steadfastness on the straight path because that is the most important gift we can all have. So this is why we say, <laughs> Guide us to the straight path. Guide us to the path of steadfastness. You know, al-istiqamah, which means steadfastness. We want to be guided to the straight path. That dua, we make it so many times a day that if I were to ask you, how many times did you pray for guidance, brother or sister today? You would have to count. You would have to say this salah, this many units, this is how many times I repeated it and this is what I said. The problem is a lot of us pay lip service to it and we don't even think for a moment that after declaring so much praise to Allah, I am asking him for guidance. As soon as we walk out of the point of salah, we begin to do things that are well within misguidance instead of guidance. So we come for salah, we have fulfilled our salah and as soon as we walk out of the masjid we already our eyes are in places they're not supposed to be our feet are walking towards a direction it's not supposed to be walking they're not supposed to be walking towards our ears are listening to that which they're not supposed to be listening to the way we speak to one another it's the way we're not supposed to be speaking to one another so why is it that we say guide us to the straight path hypocritically let's not be hypocrites Allahu Akbar after Allah is telling us this is between myself and my worshiper we say, guide us to the straight path. We need to be saying it with a genuine heart. And this is why the rest of the surah is only connected to the deeper meaning of guide us to the straight path. If, I, if you were to say, show me the path from here to say, for example, the airport. And someone showed you a path, you would perhaps want to describe to say, look, I want to know the shortest, quickest path, which has the least traffic or which would get me to the airport as soon as I can and so on. So all that is part of the description of the type of the road you want guidance upon in order to get to that airport. So if we look at Surah Al-Fatiha, we are asking for guidance. And after asking for guidance, we are telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what type of the path we would like to follow. And this is why we say, غير الصراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين. The path of those whom you have favored, whom you have granted a gift upon, نعمة, the gift upon, the path of those whom you have favored, not the path of those who have earned your anger, nor the path of those who have gone astray. So if we say not the path of those who have earned your anger, nor of those who have gone astray, we are talking of those, the first category, those who knew the truth, but they rejected it, they did not follow it. And the second category, those who were astray, neither did they know it, nor were they bothered to know it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us protection. Now if we take a look at these three categories of people, the first those whom Allah has favored, who are they? In another place in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, speaking about those whom He has granted favor upon, Allah is making mention of a type of people who will be with those whom Allah has favored. And then Allah says, those whom we have favored from amongst the messengers. So the messengers are the ones whom Allah has favored. So every salah I'm asking Allah, guide me to the path of the messengers. 
And God guide me to the path of the truthful, those who have accepted, those who are truthful, meaning when they say they believe, they follow through that belief because it would be hypocritical to say, I believe, and then we don't follow. This is why whenever we say, I believe, Allah says, I will test you to see if you are telling the truth or you are just a liar. If you look at Surah Al-Ankabut, at the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَن يُتْرَكُوا أَن يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِن قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ Allah says, does man think that we are going to allow them to say that we are believers and then they will have a happy life? Do you think, oh man, that it is enough for you to say, I'm a believer and then you will not be tested? Allah says, we have indeed tested those before you in order that we distinguish between who is truthful in their claim of belief and who is actually false. So every one of us, we claim to believe. We need to be truthful in that. And before we die, we will be tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes we are tested every day. In fact, to be honest with you, every moment of our lives is a test to see if we lead it in the obedience of our maker or if we obey the devil, shaitan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the devil and may he grant us easy treading on that path, the path of the truthful, the path of the messengers, the path of those who have sacrificed their lives for the cause. When we say sacrifice their lives, take a look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, the companions of the Prophet, may peace be upon him. There was a time when they were so few in number and they were facing such difficulty, so much challenge. They were facing, facing people who wanted to exterminate them. Had it not been for the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would have probably been exterminated as is narrated in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the time of Badr when he says, Ya Allah, these are the people taking part in the battle of Badr. If you grant us victory, we will be victorious. And if you are not to be worshipped again after today, we will lose. Allahu Akbar, which means a small number of people by the help of Allah, they dedicated and sacrificed their lives. Those were the truthful. You know, if you have a company, for example, and this is a, an example which we are just a current example seeing that people like uh, examples that fit within their brains. So if you have a company and people tell you, you know, brother, I've opened a new company and I'd like you to join me and you start thinking, you know what? Yeah, okay, you know, your plan sounds very good. Everything seems very, very rosy and it seems like workable. But you know what? It's just you and then it's going to be me, the two of us. What if this thing flops? If it flops, well, then let me tell you, we lose, don't we? And if it doesn't, we gain. So I had an SMS a few days ago telling me that if you invested $12 in Microsoft many, many years ago, today you would have $12 million. And this, when we say many, many, we're not talking of more than a decade or two, not even more than a decade, I think. I can't recall exactly. But those who invested at that time, good luck to them. They are big big, big, wealthy people who have a big say in Microsoft, don't they? Why am I giving you this example? To show you that the virtue of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum is far greater than any example we can give you today. When the deen had come and it was something new in that part of the world, those who sacrificed their lives, their investment multiplied far greater than the investment of those who followed later on. For us, it's laid on a table. We are spoon fed with the deen and still we find it difficult for us to follow. Those people who sacrificed and struggled. Today you have certain people in the West whose families are against Islam and they have accepted the faith. May Allah grant us guidance. For them sometimes, the reward they will get for steadfastness on the path may be far greater than the reward we will get because of their sacrifice. 
And because of the condition Allah has kept them upon, whereas with us, we sometimes have so much facility to follow the religion with nobody hindering us, but we still don't want to dress properly. We still don't want to fulfill our prayer. What are we waiting for? There are countries on the globe where they won't want you to dress properly. And still our sisters, may Allah grant them strength, they are dressing so appropriately, facing all forms of flack and all forms of challenge and difficulty. What a great sacrifice they have. Yet we sitting in a country where it is open market, free for you to dress properly. It's difficult for you not to dress properly. And still we find ourselves wanting. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. This is why we say, Alladheena an'amta alayhim. Those whom Allah has favored upon. May Allah make us also from amongst those whom He has favored. He has indeed favored us by giving us the deen. By making us... People who are following the example of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We are very fortunate. The biggest gift that we have is the gift of Iman. The gift of faith. Sometimes we take it for granted. And sometimes we allow the glamour and the glitter of the dunya to overtake our hearts and minds. And we become people who get so engrossed in the dunya that we begin to drown in it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. I am not saying at all that we should divorce ourselves from you know, that which is material, but the limits are set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should know them. Our indulgence in that which is material should never be at the, at the cost of our link with our own maker. We should never ever want to do something that would compromise our link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Let's get back to this an'amta alayhim. We said those who have sacrificed their lives and the pious, the good, as salihin those who are good and pious. If you say as salih a person who is good, a person who has piety in him. So we are asking Allah so many times a day, Ya Allah, make me follow the path of those who, whom you have befriended, those whom you have favored upon, the, the path of the messengers, the path of those who sacrifice their lives for your cause. And with us, it's not like we have to sacrifice a life for the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can't even sacrifice 10 minutes for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala five times a day sometimes. So where is the gap between us and them? One is people who have sacrificed the entire life. And one is for us to sacrifice 10 minutes five times a day. Not even sometimes. And sometimes you have a talk of this nature. Or you have perhaps a program which might appear on television or a program that might be on the radio or a cassette, a CD that you can just put into your vehicle whilst you're driving. And as you know, going to work and coming back from work, you make use of that time. And still we don't do that. We cannot find ourselves sitting in front of, you know, a screen that has a program in it, which is beneficial to us from a scholar of your choice. You choose him, you will find him. Who do you want to listen to? Tell yourself. Ask yourself, today we have no excuse. You have technology at your fingertips. You can pick on YouTube the topic you want from the scholar you want and listen to it. Still, we are not doing that. But if I were to tell you, brother, there is 100,000 Qatari riyals just out there being given, I think we would all go, perhaps I might even follow. Allah protect us. <laughs> Allah safeguard us. So this is how man has become. Believe me, my brothers and sisters, the reason I raise this, I am encouraging myself and yourselves to make use of your time, to make use of technology. And remember, as good as technology is, it is also destructive if you do not use it correctly. So who you want to listen to, find out from those you trust. I want to listen to this person. How is it to listen to him? Or what they are saying, is it based on that which is authentic or is it just fairy tale? If it is fairy tale, we want to stay away from it. If it is authentic, we would like to listen to it because fairy tale, everybody is able. Everybody is able and capable to give you fairy tale. But not everybody is able and capable to give you that which is authentic. Sometimes it might not be, you know, something that you would like to hear in the sense that people don't like to be told bluntly, brother, this is astray. You know, if someone were to tell you, brother, this is astray, it would be difficult to digest. But sometimes if that is the truth, we need to surrender to it, just like the Sahaba radiallahu anhum did. And this is where Surah Al-Fatiha comes in. When we say, oh Allah, guide us to that path of those who, whom you have favored upon. Those were the ones whom, when they heard a verse of the Quran being recited to them, 
they immediately surrendered. It trembled their hearts. Their skin had goosebumps on it because of the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take a look at the gullies and alleys of Medina al Munawwara at the time when alcohol was made prohibited. It is reported that everybody poured out the alcohol completely because it became haram. And the announcers were announcing that alcohol has been made prohibited this day. Nobody said, no man, come on, where did you get that from? Nobody said that. It was made prohibited. They dropped it, they spat it out, they poured it out and it was gone. And that was it, history. It's over. They had the power of surrendering to the decree of the maker. May Allah grant us that power. Today we are told, sister, your dress code. We say, no, I'm still young, you know. I'm still young, you know. Brother, you know what, this bad company. No, what will the company do? So what? These are just young youngsters hanging about, you know. If they have bad habits, it's bad company. When Allah and His Messenger have warned you about your company. Ya amanu wa kunu The broader interpretation of that verse. O oh, you who believe, be conscious of your maker. Be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ensure that you are in the company of as sadiqeen Those who are truthful, the righteous. Make sure your company is correct. Be with them. That is the broader meaning of this verse. So if Allah is warning us about that, how can I not want to change the, my companionship who wastes my time every day sitting up to so long at night and doing absolutely nothing? May Allah grant us true benefit of our time. When we are sitting together, even if you are talking about business, let one statement in that meeting be something religious. It's not difficult. When you are sitting in your own meetings, you have met your brothers or whoever it is, sisters meeting each other, or even a family gathering. Before you get up from that meeting, from that gathering, let one statement at least be a direct encouragement of something spiritual, something religious. Wallahi, you will add a new flavor to that whole meeting. And we don't want to, we don't want to convey a message in a manner that you try to make them feel, you know what, you people are not even proper Muslims, man. It happens sometimes where people look at us and the way they look at us, like, you know what, I'm not even fit to be a Muslim. The way the brother is carrying on, you know, no chance for you. You're, you can't you feel the heat of Jahannam already? Allah safeguard us. Allah protect us. If that is the type of behavior we have, we are not going to call people towards Islam. Brother, let me tell you what I have found very effective. When you make a sinful Muslim feel like a Muslim at least, he will inshallah eradicate that sin because he begins to feel the identity. So when someone is sinful and I come from a country where we are in a minority, the freedom is such that nobody is going to ask you a question if you did not come to the masjid besides those who care for you. So if we were to make people feel like they are non-Muslim just because they are sinful Muslims, they might go further into the sin because of the freedom around them. But if we are to make them feel, brother, you know what, my sister, mashallah, you are doing so well, you might even be a better person than me. Let me remind myself and yourselves about something very small. You know, let's never ever tell a lie. One thing you said. Whatever we say, and I'm not saying it because you've told a lie or because I have told a lie, it's just a reminder of the good word of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we go away. We made it so simple and we greeted the, the, the brother or the sister, we made them feel like Muslims. And tomorrow what will happen? By the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will feel the link. They will feel an identity. They will identify themselves as Muslims. Whereas, as I said moments ago, the minute we draw such a big line and we say, no, these people are out of the fold. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. We will actually chisel deeper and we minimize the chances of bringing them onto what is right. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us steadfastness and goodness. So every day we make this dua so many times in Surah Al-Fatiha. We need to think about it on a daily basis. Oh Allah, I'm asking you to guide me to such a powerful path. I'm asking you to guide me to the path of those whom you have favored. I am asking you to protect me from the path of those who have earned your anger. Humul ladina araful haqqa wa tarakuhu. They are the ones who knew the truth and they left it. Sometimes we know the truth and we leave it. We might not be from amongst the same category as in what is mentioned in the surah, but some of our qualities begin to appear like those. 
Sometimes we know what is right and wrong, but we couldn't be bothered to follow it. You find, brother, what's happening? It's time for Jumu'ah. Nah, don't worry. The Imam speaks very long. So I will sleep until I hear aqulu qawli hadha. Then I will get up. If that's the case, we are losers. Brother, you know what is right. The Jumu'ah is our Eid. It's our day of happiness. Today we want to celebrate those parties that Islam does not even allow us to celebrate and we make a big issue of it. Whereas on a Friday, it's not like it's a party, but it's a day of joy and happiness. You should take pride in the fact that you are coming to listen to the wa'al, to listen to the khutbah, and you should be here early. There is so much encouragement for it in what the messenger, may peace be upon him, has said. And still we find brothers, they are arriving late. After the khutbah starts, that's when they get up. They say, no, today is a holiday. Wallahi, it's a holiday from work, but it's not a holiday from deen. And this is why whenever there is a good day of happiness and joy, there is an extra ibadah as Muslims to show us that you know what you don't ever have a holiday from religion one day we had a young man young boy actually he came up and he said you know what my father always tells me to pray every day can't we have a break <laughs> he's telling me can't we have a break now something came to my mind quite immediately at that moment and alhamdulillah we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that I said son you can have a break he said when I said when you stop breathing so if you have a break breathing, you can have a break praying. So he said, so if I hold my breath, I don't need to pray? <laughs> Young boy. I told him, well, try it. Let's see how long you're going to hold your breath for. He held it for less than a minute. He said, okay, okay, I understand now. Which means we have to pray for the one who gave us this life. We cannot say that today is a break. Look at the day of Eid. There is an extra salah and a khutbah. Look at the day of Jum'ah. There is an extra salah. Or in fact, the salah, there is an extra khutbah. Not the, the salah is not actually extra, but the, there is a khutbah that we come to listen to. It's a day where we are going to listen to a message. And if we cannot take back some new Islamic knowledge on a weekly basis, at least once, why do we call ourselves Muslims? What's the point? I, do, I want to live my life without knowing more about my religion. Wallahi, go and look at the churches around. You will find them more dedicated sometimes than us. From where I come, they sit in the evenings, hours on end, studying the Bible and studying various other books. And they sit doing their own thing and they come from far and wide. And when it comes to us, subhanallah, salatul fajr, and you find just a few people there. By the way, some of them are yawning. We've got to obviously encourage them still. So even if you're yawning, still come inshallah. And then inshallah, we'll tackle the yawning a little bit later on. But sometimes we find nobody's interested, you know. No, one brother told me from the UK a few days ago. He says, you know, here in the UK, we can read Maghrib, Isha and Fajr one time. I said, but how? He says, because you see the sun, it sets before it goes really down, it's up again. So I said, look, I, it's the first time I'm hearing this. I do know of some Scandinavian countries that do have a problem. But to come to me and tell me that three salah must be read together, it sounds very un-Islamic. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and grant us goodness. Obviously, we'd have to study the sun and how, how it sets and so on. And I'm sure the ulama in that region have gone into it and what have you. But the point here is out of laziness, sometimes we want to just join up salawat and join them up where it is permissible, it's okay. But join them up where it is not permissible to join. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala an opening. And this is why we say sometimes, you know, if you look at Surah Al-Fatiha, and you look at the simple tafsir of it, it will say immediately, Al-Maghdubi alayhim, those are the ones who knew the truth, and they left it, they rejected it, they denied it, because it didn't suit them. And the people of the book and the Jewish people are made mention of. However, what we need to know, is making this dua is very important. You know, people are quick to say, yeah, Sheikh, let's make a dua. Make dua for me, Sheikh. But brother, you make a dua every day in every rak'ah of salah. Why don't you take that so seriously as you do to say, make a dua. Come, let's make a dua. Brother, we don't make it. It's not a pot or something that you've got to make something and pour it. Ya Akhi, you need to know you are calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Add meaning to it. And I want to add an open word of encouragement for all of us here. If you have lived in the Arab world for more than a year and you do not know the Arabic language, shame upon you. 
Did you hear what I said? Everyone's looking at me as though they, they want to beat me up. I'm being honest. If you have lived in the Arab world for more than a year and you don't know the Arabic language, you are at a loss. Because all those who have gone to Britain and America who have lived there for a few months or a year have come back with a lot of the English language. You follow what I've said? Those who go, believe me, learn the English language because they want to get on with the dunya. We need to learn the Arabic language because we want to get on with the akhirah. We want to get on with the life after death. Your level of Iman is compromised if you don't know the Arabic language, period. And I'm telling you, it's, it might sound harsh, but I'm being honest with you. Your level of Iman is compromised if you don't taste the sweetness of that message in its language. And this is why if you look at the Bible and the Old Testament and so on, what did they do? The language spoken by the Prophet Jesus, may peace be upon him, was Aramaic. Today, where is the Aramaic scripture? They will tell you, we don't have it. And if they tell you, here is the Hebrew scripture, they have so many different versions of it. Some versions have more books than others. So where did it go? How did it get lost? Let me quickly explain in a different way. They adjusted the book of God for them to understand it. We have to adjust ourselves to understand the book of our God, the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why when you find the translation of the Quran, and I see quite a few here, mashallah. When you open it on one side, you find the word of Allah in the Arabic language. The other side, the attempt of man to try and explain to you what it means. There you are. So that is why sometimes you have people who might explain something slightly differently. But the word of Allah remains the same. So we will adjust ourselves to understand the word of Allah. We will not adjust the word of Allah for us to understand because then what happened to the previous books? They, they lost. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the point. And this is why I say, and I'm going back to the Arabic language. When we say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen and you know what it means and you know exactly the interpretation of it and you have it in your mind then you know mashallah this salah is going to be beneficial for me more than if i don't know what it means i'm just paying lip service to it and sometimes as i said and i told you i'll show you when we're in a rush we don't even realize that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds with the verses so you find a brother or a sister what is that wallahi it's happening the only thing you can hear is Dalin. Do you know what Dalin means? It means those who are astray. Oh, Akbar. It means those who are astray. So why is it that we rush our salah? And we rush such a powerful surah in, in the Quran. That is a surah where Tawheed of all its three categories is reiterated. If you look at Allah's names, you will find them there. If you look at Allah's qualities, you will find them there. If you look at the, the worship of Allah, the, the fact that He is the deity, and the fact that He is the only one worthy of worship, you find it there. We say, You alone we worship. We are declaring what is known as uluhiya, the fact that the deity is Allah alone. None is worthy of worship besides Him. We are saying, You alone we worship, You alone we ask for help. Amazing. We are asking him from his mercy. We say, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, most beneficent, most merciful. If you were to ask me, what's the difference between the two? When they are both extracted from the same root word of the Arabic language, I will tell you, one has a broader meaning than the other. One is a specialized mercy for those who have believed. And the other is a mercy for all creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which includes those who have disbelieved as well. This is why Allah says in the Quran, وَكَانَ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَحِيمًا It is Allah, one of His qualities towards the believers is He has what is known as, or He is Rahimun. Rahim meaning a specific type of mercy, especially allocated for those who have believed. And we are asking this to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now come, you know people say, this guy worships his wife. Have you ever heard that statement? This guy worships his wife. I see a lot of brothers saying yes. Is not, the meaning of it is not worship as in 
rendering an act of worship for. No, all it means is he obeys his wife's instructions. That's what it means. And I can give you on a lighter note, and I really like this because it plugs in. We are all human beings and we like a little bit of, you know, humor sometimes. They say there was a king and he called all his subjects, the males, and he says, anyone who is ruled by his wife, come in this line. And whoever rules his wife, where, you know, the instructions are not obeyed, so to speak, or they come from you as a man, then you stand in this line. So the whole community stood in the wrong line. Allahu Akbar. They all stood in a line saying, no, if my wife sees me in the other line, I'm dead meat. You see? <laughs> so what happened is, they all got one egg each, an egg. They were given one egg. And there was one man who stood in the line. I'm the man. You know, in the house, I'm the man. So the king was so happy, at least amongst my subjects, there is one man who has such greatness, you know, meaning he has the quality, a rujula, you know, he's a man, you know. So now the king gave him a horse, brown horse. And the, in fact, the king told him, choose from the horses you want. So he chose the brown one and left the black one. And he rode home, galloping away. Everyone else went home with one egg. So when he got home, his wife, he looked at her and says, do you know what? She says, what? Today I got a horse because I am the boss. You see, I got a horse because I'm the boss. She says, okay, that's good. Excellent. So you're the boss. So he says, you know, I was told to choose from three horses. There was a white one, a black one, and this brown one that I've actually come with. This was the best one. She says, wow, you look great in it. You look great in this horse, but you'd look greater in the black one. He says, well, not a problem. I had a choice. I can go back and get the black one. So he goes back galloping to the castle. <laughs> and he says, oh, king. The king says, yes, what's happening? He says, I just want to swap my horse. He says, why? When I went home, my wife told me that you'd look better in the black horse. The king says, no problem. He took the horse and gave him one egg. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. So the moral of the story is obedience. We're talking of obedience. People say you worship someone when you obey them. You know, people say this man worships his wife because he obeys. Wallahi, we don't even understand that the example of Allah is higher. We can never ever equate Allah with any human being. But we need to know that ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also connected to obeying His instructions. And Allah will not tell you to do something that is detrimental for you. He won't. Whatever Allah has instructed you to do, and whatever He has asked you to abstain from, all of that is for your benefit, O oh man. Why is it that we want to look at it and think that this is very difficult? When, if someone were to tell us to do something that is not beneficial for us, because we love them, we might end up doing it. Why is it that we don't show higher love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. And may He really make us from those who realize this. We call upon His mercy. We say, all praise is due to Allah. You know that Alhamdu, when we say Alhamdu, we are talking of all praise. Because the Alif and the Lam in the Arabic language is not always for one meaning. It actually sometimes comes in order to, to cover every single aspect of the item that is connected to it. So when we say Alhamdu, we are saying all praise is due unto Allah. No matter how much we praise Allah, it's not enough. And this is why we, we make a dua that, Oh Allah, for you is praise for as long as much praise as would make you happy, as much praise as would make you pleased up to when you are pleased and even beyond the point that pleases you, you still own all the praise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really be pleased with us and may he accept the statement from us. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. And when we say Rabbul Alameen, what are we confirming? We are confirming, you see the term Rabbun, it's a very simple Arabic term. Its meaning will fill a whole booklet in the English language. Believe me, when we say Rabbun, it includes the one who nourishes, cherishes, sustains, provides for, protects, you know, the, the, the curer, sustainer, the one who is in absolute control of every aspect of the existence of myself is my Rabb. That is the meaning of the term Rabbun, just to start off with. So when I say Rabbul Alameen, which means the one who is in absolute control of every aspect of all the worlds. All the worlds means, you know, you could say mankind, jinn kind, all the creatures. You can also go beyond that and say this world. And if there is any other galaxy or Milky Way besides this, Allah knows best. He is still the Rabb of everything that is in creation. 
all creatures are absolutely depend up dependent upon the Creator Himself. We're declaring such great greatness in, in Salah, in Surah Al-Fatiha. And this is why it is also known as Ummul Quran, one of the names of the Surah. You know, we say the mother of the Quran. In the Arabic language, the term mother of is used in order to portray how serious an item is. You know, the mother of, of all, for example, some things. You might want to say the mother of this or that, meaning something very important, something very big. And here we say this is one of the most important surahs of the whole Quran because it is called Ummul Quran. Wallahi, it is so rich in meaning that we would not be doing justice to it if we just spoke for half an hour or one hour. But this is only a synopsis. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately after that makes mention of the qualities of His. Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. So you find Rububiyyah, which means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the nourisher, cherisher, sustainer, provider, protector. He is the Rabb. And then you find the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same surah. Nobody is to be associated with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a partner in worship that is uluhiyyah nor in any of his names or qualities that is known as al-asma wa sifat the names and the qualities of Allah he is unique in them he is singular in them he is the only one who has those qualities and names of that level and we will never associate a partner with him in that and we will not associate partnership in worship because we worship Allah alone and this is why we say you alone we worship and you alone we seek help from today when we make a dua if we were in the corner of our our homes in the darkest hours of the night to call out to our maker we would only be allowed to call out to him and none else no tree no stick no stone no grave no saint, no creature at all. We don't call out to any prophet and we don't render any act of worship for anybody besides the one who made me. For your information, that is what makes Islam so palatable. That is what makes Islam so acceptable amongst those who are non-Muslims. Today, if you ask the non-Muslims who turn to Islam, what is it that drove you to Islam? The majority will answer you and say, the concept of Godhood in Islam. I plug into my maker. I don't need to go and confess to a pastor. I don't need to go and confess to an archbishop. Because to be honest, that pastor and that archbishop might be worse than me secretly behind closed doors. And wallahi, it has happened. I know of an incident where they had hidden cameras that exposed a certain pastor of a church who used to say, I forgive you, my child, to everybody else. And himself, he was a bigger criminal than what was happening. So he was forgiving people of a sin that he was guilty of an even greater one than. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Imagine with us, if you have committed a sin, your sin is your secret between you and your maker. He will forgive it. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves, never lose hope in the mercy of your maker. For indeed Allah will forgive all your sins. He is most forgiving, most merciful. Who will forgive your sins? A tree? A grave? Another man? No, Allah. He is most forgiving, most merciful. So you confess your sin to Allah, Meaning you admit it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you feel the remorse, the regret and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness and you promise not to do it again. With those conditions, your sin is wiped out. Your sin is wiped out. We believe very firmly that the one who has sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is completely sinless if Allah has accepted the tawbah. And 
The signs of acceptance of tawbah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he accepts the tawbah, one of the signs of acceptance of repentance is our lives have changed. Your life changes. You can't say, you know what, I uh, went to the nightclub, so oh Allah forgive me, and tomorrow already you have planned to go there tomorrow night. What type of foolish behavior is that? If you were dealing with a human being, some people can do that because the human being doesn't know. But you cannot cheat Allah. You cannot cheat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah grant us forgiveness. This is why we have the discussion of all three aspects of Tawheed in the same surah. Because we don't associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any of his names or qualities. In rendering any act of worship. We don't associate partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any of his names or qualities, as we said, in rendering any act of worship and in confirming the fact that he is the maker, the creator, the nourisher, the cherisher, the sustainer, the provider, the protector. What someone gives you, if, they, if Allah has given them the power to give it to you, they have given it to you because Allah has given them the power to do so. For example, if I were to ask you, brother, can I please have that water? If Allah doesn't want that to happen, it won't happen. It won't happen. But within visible means, when, when I say visible means, here we talk about visibly, I can see that it's very near to him. He has a hand and he can pass it to me very easily. Then I can ask him for that, knowing that ultimately Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can either allow it or disallow it. But for me to render any act of worship, any act of worship, for anyone besides Allah, what makes me different from the Christians? What makes me different from those who have worshipped a messenger? In fact, perhaps they have rendered an act of worship for someone better than the one that others have ended an act, rendered an act of worship for, but it makes it unacceptable. It is still unacceptable. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Indeed, this issue of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is driven home in Surah Al-Fatiha. And this is why sometimes you have people saying, you know, it's a surah that I haven't understood. And you think to yourself, how can you not have understood Surah Al-Fatiha when it has the core of belief? It guides you the way. It will lead you to the path. And it will ensure that you do not render an act of worship for anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I wish to end by saying that there is a very fine line between respect and worship. Some people respect another human being and they cross the line to worship without really sometimes pondering over it. So remember, no matter how knowledgeable I may be or anyone else may be, we respect them, but we don't worship them. There is a difference, very big difference, but it's a fine line at the same time. So sometimes you find people, they treat a knowledgeable person as though he is a God. It happens. And it happens in a lot of societies and communities. We would say, if you are rendering an act of worship or if you have superstitious beliefs that this man knows the unseen or this man has this and that, then we are heading in the wrong direction. It is Allah alone whom we render acts of worship for. And the reason I chose to end in that way is because no matter how advanced a person can have got in this world, we will not render an act of worship for anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May He open our doors and may He grant us Really, ease of learning the Arabic language. We have to reiterate that. Make an intention now that I will do my best to learn. People are paying to do courses to learn, you know, diploma in this subject and that subject. Why don't we do an online course of the Arabic language, even if you have to pay? Why don't we visit our Arabic friends and tell them, listen, brother, do not speak to me in any other language but Arabic. Sometimes you have friends, Arab friends, who will tell you, I speak to you in English because you are my friend. Tell them, when you visit my country, you can speak in my language. Today I am in this country, I will speak in yours. Allahu Akbar. And the idea is only, only to understand the revelation better and to develop our own iman. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors until we meet again. We say, Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta.